All right. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today for the introduction to Bow Design webinar with Dr. Hinden. Um, we're very honored to have him talk to us today. Um, but before we get started, I just want to share a little bit about the projects the Bow Design and Innovation Committee is putting together this year. Um, so as you may know, the webinar today is the first of a five-part webinar series where speakers will be talking more in depth about the different steps of the bio design process from identifying a clinical need and developing a concept to bring this idea to market. Um, so as part of this initiative, we are also trying to assess the impact of bio design webinar series on student education and understanding of the bio design process. So we would really appreciate if you could take a minute or so to fill out this short survey if you haven't already. Um, so you should have also received a pre-survey link in your email earlier today, but if not, you can scan the QR code here, which will bring you to the survey. So thank you so much for helping us out with this project. Um, so another quick plug is um, the annual biodesign competition that our committee holds. Um, so we invite teams of medical students, undergraduates, and or graduate students to form teams to tackle challenges in IR. Um, so this year, the theme for our competition is COVID. Um, so we encourage teams to design a solution that will address one of the problems that clinicians and practices have encountered during the pandemic. Um, so you can also scan the QR code here for the link to sign up, which also contains more information about the competition as well. So the webinar series is designed to run alongside the competition and kind of guide teams through the bio design process. So we encourage teams to like follow along with the webinar series during this competition. So yeah, that's my little spiel. So um, I'm gonna let Deepak introduce Dr. Hinton now. Yeah, thank you, Selena. Hey everyone, thanks for coming out again tonight um, for the kickoff for our biodesign webinar series. The biodesign process provides a refined approach to healthcare technology innovation. And tonight we'll be learning about the fundamentals of this process from our speaker. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. David Hinden. Dr. Hinden graduated from the University of Pennsylvania's medical school and did his gen general surgery residency at Temple University while also studying innovation management and entrepreneurship. During this time, he also founded Invented Magazine, which highlights entrepreneurs in technology and medicine. Upon finishing residency, Dr. Hinden completed a biodesign innovation fellowship at the Stanford Byers Center for Biodesign. He now practices as a general surgeon at the Palo Alto VA Medical Center while also running a YouTube channel on the side. Without further ado, let's give a big welcome to Dr. David Hinden. Hi, um, thanks for the kind introduction. It's, it's uh, a little weird to present to a computer screen. So um, I'm assuming, can you guys hear my audio okay? Um, I'm gonna take that as a yes. And uh, Deepak, just shoot me a text message if you're having an issue with the audio or the video. So yeah, we'll uh, as Deepak had mentioned today, we're gonna to talk about biodesign from uh, the overall perspective of sort of looking from the top down. Um, I had spent a, a year at Stanford's uh, biodesign fellowship as a fellow. Um, and now I'm sort of uh, applying that process over and over in my own life um, as I explore new projects and opportunities. So we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about that today in a very abbreviated version to sort of um, get the lay of the land for how to apply it. Um, so as Deepak had mentioned, I am a general surgeon by training. Um, I'm now a, a bio designer, as all of you will be um, at the end of this process, and uh, I make YouTube videos on the side. Um, I know all of you are at slightly different uh, parts of your trajectory. Um, mine uh, had been largely in Philadelphia. Uh, this is my first time out on the, uh, the West Coast since I moved out here. So today we're going to talk about the process with a heavy focus on the front end. Um, so as you know, biodesign is this methodology that was originally developed at Stanford, um, but it's now applied broadly throughout the industry within companies and in other training programs around the country and uh, all around the world. And even though it was created for health tech startups, this can really be applied to anything. Um, 
And as you see here on the screen, this uh, sort of classic biodesign uh, model shows the full process, starting with identifying the problem and sort of formulating the full need that needs to be fixed all the way through to launching the final product. Um, so for me, it took about uh, 10 months that we had in the biodesign fellowship to really kind of work this process from start to finish. And today we have about 35 minutes or so. Um, so this will be a little bit faster, but hopefully you'll get the you'll get the highlights and the the key concepts kind of down pat. And then we're going to have plenty of time um, for Q and A. Um, and one final nuts and bolts thing before we dive into it, uh, I'd love for this to be as interactive as possibly can be, um, given the sort of tech constraints. So if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to pop them into your questions area. Um, and I'm happy to pause uh, throughout this to sort of chat more. Um, I intentionally left enough space in the slides that there'd be plenty of room for us to all talk. So this is a quote that uh, those of us that were physically um, at, at Biodesign Stanford heard repeated throughout the year. And this is really um, kind of the core philosophy of all of biodesign. Um, it really anchors itself on the belief that to really, really be effective, um, you have to have a deep understanding of the problem. And five levels deeper or six levels deeper than someone who's just sort of walking by and noticing the problem might have. Um, and when you really, really understand the core need within the problem, that's what allows you to unlock all kinds of insights and be uh, incredibly effective. Um, so these are two, two examples that uh, Stanford Biodesign holds near and dear. On the left, you see the, the Zio patch, which is one of the products from iRhythm. Uh, on the right, we see Shockwave. Um, both of these are companies that came out of Biodesign um, and are both valued at uh, well over a billion dollars now. Um, and then here we see um, another dozen plus companies that have been born out of the Stanford Biodesign Fellowship. Um, and this isn't to brag, um, but it's really to drive home the point that when you focus on understanding the real core of the need and really figuring out the core detail, the core nuance that needs to be fixed to fix the whole problem, that's what unlocks all the potential to be so successful. So, I've kind of boiled down the process to these sort of uh, road signs. And as we sort of walk through these road signs, I've distilled down the whole biodesign process to these key steps. Um, so together, we're going to talk about how to follow these steps and then how to leverage them for your own success um, to invent stuff, either in this sort of current curriculum that you guys are in or in life as you move forward. Um, and one thing to keep in mind when you are beginning, when you're sort of starting out uh, with you know the goal of inventing something and you haven't yet decided, the real key at this stage is not to pick a problem or a need to focus on upfront. The pick is to kind of open up your arms and really start off by going for quantity. You're really just observing things and seeing what, uh, what sort of shortcomings you're noticing in healthcare, see what pain points patients have, see what pain points their providers have. And right now, all you're doing is just gathering them and making lists. Um, and we're going to get to that in a couple minutes, what you'll do with those lists. Uh, but first, we're going to talk a little bit more um, about a need statement. And the need statement is really kind of the, the engine that drives this whole process for you. Um, so on the outside, uh, entrepreneurs talk about needs uh, and sort of use that interchangeably with problems. Um, but for us, when we're using the biodesign process, need is more than just uh, the problem itself. So the need is really referring to the need statement, um, which contains the problem, but focuses it down to the specific population that has that problem, and then to a specific outcome that you can uh, sort of hope to achieve by solving that problem. And this encapsulates what will then become your roadmap. And it will help you understand not only what you need to invent, but how to invent it. Um, so again, the problem that we see here, um, in this situation, I have written health-related shortcoming affecting patients. Um, that's intentionally broad. Um, so it can be anything from you know, the physician's end, which is on the surface 1,000% physician-facing, you know, something you know, that, that is causing them to spend more time in the EMR than they want, 
all the way down to something that on the surface seems like it's a, a creature comfort for patients only, you know, a, a more comfortable dressing or something. Um, but it, it encompasses the entire spectrum of patient care, potentially. Um, and anything under that umbrella is eligible for us. Um, the population drills down to the group of patients that are the most affected by this problem. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more um, as we go on. But there's a temptation when we look at something to say, gee, you know, this is a problem that everyone has. This is a problem that affects tons and tons and tons of people. And the real goal in order to be effective with this process is to start off at that surface level and then peel back a layer and say, okay, uh, but who's really affected? Okay, in that group, who is bothered the most by this problem? And as you go deeper and deeper, you're gonna to get to a more specific group of patients that not only has the same problem, but it appears in the same way, it might be brought on by the same set of risk factors, and that will allow you to start to unlock insight that will help when you reach the inventing process. Finally, the outcome um, is in this need statement, and that's because you, you kind of have to have that outcome up front. Um, it, it sort of feels like sometimes that the problem and the outcome should be uh, sort of a given. Once you have one, you have the other. But the way you phrase your outcome and the way you target your outcome will impact the type of invention that you make. So for example, let's say we had a uh, particular type of monitor. Let's say uh, we were looking at central lines and uh, the problem was uh, central line associated bloodstream infections. And uh, you know we can pick any, any population that we'd focus. Let's just say we're gonna focus on uh, people who had been in the ICU for, for more than seven days. And uh, let's say you were trying to choose an outcome. Now, one person might say, well, you know, our ultimate outcome is to reduce the hospital length of stay. Someone else might say, our ultimate outcome is to improve patient survival. And, you know, all these things are going to be related, but you can see that as you adjust the outcome, it's going to adjust the types of ideas and the types of inventions that you end up thinking to create. So here's an example of a need statement. Um, this is one that I put together with, uh, with a few teammates earlier this year when we were starting to look uh, at the surface level, some of the problems that were coming up in COVID. And um, as everyone remembers, there were uh, reports of healthcare workers, and there still are, but healthcare workers becoming infected with COVID. And so there was this uh, homegrown effort all around the country for people to 3D print masks and 3D print shields. And it was this sort of very surface level understanding that, you know, healthcare providers just don't have enough PPE. So we're going to fix the problem by chipping in to get donations and make PPE. But, you know, it turns out that when a healthcare worker has all of the PPE in the world and has the exact perfect PPE, we've actually learned from studying the Ebola epidemic that there's still a 20 to 30 percent rate of auto inoculation and contamination when you're taking off your PPE. And so as we started to drill down, we started off at the surface level with the problem of healthcare workers getting infected with COVID. But as we started to drill down, we saw that the problem was really effectively and safely removing that PPE. And of all the PPE, the respirators were the highest risk. Um, so we, we found out that the real problem at hand was removing that safely without self-contaminating. Um, the population that we have in the screen here is still pretty broad. And then the outcome was uh, infection caused by self-contamination. So again, that's, that's just one example of a need statement, but you can see here how this starts to sort of shape the map and the pathway for how you might then approach solving that. So I hinted at this a little bit, but for every need statement you can think of, that need statement exists on a continuum. So it's focused into the level that you have chosen, the amount of uh, how specific you wanna get, but you have the ability to go broader or more narrow with any need statement. So we think of it as uh, branches on a tree. So I have that need statement from uh, a couple slides ago at the top of the screen here. And then around this tree, we see some examples. So at the bottom of the tree, um, if we wanted to scope the population, the broadest population would be to say all people, all ages, all sizes, all professions. And if we go all the way to the top of the tree and go out to some of those leaves at the end of the branches, 
you could get really specific and say only male surgeons who are surgical oncologists who are older than 65 and who have been exposed to a COVID patient for at least 20 minutes. And you can see that that feels a little bit too narrow. Um, and for example, um, you might end up somewhere in the middle, like we have here, healthcare providers that are in ICUs of patients that have COVID-19. Um, so that's not to show that that is the perfect population and that that's already been validated and chosen, but it shows that it, it exists in the continuum. And as you go through this process, you're always trying to find the sweet spot. You wanna include as many people as you can because when you guys build your products and you build your inventions, you wanna to go to investors and say, the TAM or the, the total addressable market is huge, it's in the billions, but you also want to know that you have built an invention that can address every single person in your target population effectively. So I have this sign here because there is a temptation to rush the process. There's a temptation to sometimes to look at technology that's neat and say, gee, this could be used for this and this and this and start cranking out products. And there's a temptation sometimes to look at a problem, think quickly of uh, you know, a way that you might solve it and take off and go. And what the biodesign process really forces you to do is to be rigorous about that. So you prevent yourself from dumping years and years and millions of dollars into something that when you get to the end of the spectrum, flops whether it's, you know, there's too much risk or it doesn't work well enough or your target population isn't incentivized to use it or any of a bunch of reasons. So I say ignore your own risk because by going through this process, you're, you're really protecting yourself um, from wasted time and wasted money. So I alluded to this, but uh, the next step is to start with all of the needs and all of the problems that you guys have collected and start to filter those down. So for each problem that you notice, you'll write up a need statement or a few different need statements, but then you, you have your arms around multiple, multiple need statements and you have to figure out which one you're gonna pick. And this is an element where personal preference, either of you as the inventor or you and your teammates really starts to come into play. So on the right-hand side of the screen here, I have a few examples, um, things like market size, things like disease mechanism, which means hey, this is a really well understood mechanism, or hey, this is a mechanism that needs about five years in the basic science lab before people really understand how it works. Um, and moving down the this, this slide, we see things like blue sky versus incremental, um, things like founder expertise, uh, maybe founder interest, and what the funding climate might be. The key here is that these are, this is not an exhaustive list, so there are all sorts of parameters that you can use as your filters. But what this will ultimately reflect is what you want to work on and what you see as value. And that different that answer is going to be different for everyone. So this is a conversation to have with your team up front and start deciding how you want to focus on things. So uh, I, I stole this picture online, um, but and this is a, a little bit later in the process. But what I like here is it shows you how you start off with a bunch of unmet needs. And as you move through the filters, you come out with less and less. Um, so in the screen here, they talk about eliminating redundancies. Um, so especially when you work in teams, if you go immerse yourself and then you come back together, you'll find that lots of your teammates have started to notice some similar things. So right off the bat, you can chop off things that are duplicates. Um, and then as you get down here, you'll see things like technical complexity and IP landscape. Um, I would warn you, do not think about IP landscape right now in the beginning. That's something to think about later, because if you start to look at needs and then you dive into the IP landscape, you're going to get intimidated. You're going to think, oh, this thing's already been done and you're going to end up leaving good needs on the table. So uh, that that last item in this diagram, I'll totally agree with. I would say to uh, keep your blinders on at this stage in terms of IP. And then finally, once you have your criteria set and you know either how you're gonna filter your needs or you've already applied it and filtered your needs. The final step is to set boundaries for your inventing process. We call these needs criteria. So the criteria for a need is a way of saying, you know, in order to effectively solve the need, it has to do this, it has to do this, and it has to do this other thing. And you use those as filters to screen your inventions. And so we break those down into 
what we call must-haves and nice-to-haves. Um, so I've left these nice-to-haves blank because it can kind of be anything. And the must-haves here, if you read these, I intentionally have these uh, to sort of reflect different categories. So this first one here, X percent infection rate, you're going to always have a must-have that is some sort of measurable parameter that links directly to the outcome. You're always going to have a must-have that is going to be usability. So that might mean, you know, it can be used by a provider with X amount of training. It can be used by, um, you know, uh, someone that doesn't have access to a certain type of equipment. Um, but you're always going to have some sort of usability parameter. You're always going to have something that's uh, framing the cost of the device. And this is going to be a work in process. So you may not have a great handle on exactly how much it, it should cost. But before you start filtering your inventions, you, you might want to research, you know, the average cost of things that are on the market so far that might be your competitors to, to sort of start getting a way to frame yourself. And then finally, this is must not cause bleeding. Um, you're always going to have a must not. So um, certain complications that are uh, unacceptable or certain amounts of problems that are unacceptable. And the key is to be really thoughtful as you write these, because once you have set your must haves, any invention that you think of that doesn't say yes to these must haves, you just chop right away. Because that way you that way you're making sure that you're going to invent something that does the job. And then the final step in this process is ideation or brainstorming. Um, and we're going to talk about that in a couple minutes. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over with all of you um, some techniques that we use and some ways that you can sort of think about brainstorming and think about leveraging creativity. Uh, but I'm going to just pause for a second to take a quick recap so that we can just reflect on what we've talked about so far. Um, so I've really kind of hammered home um, the importance and the philosophy of uh, innovation being needs driven and really zeroing in on that need. Uh, we've talked about what makes up a need statement and how a need statement is different from just a surface level problem. Uh, we've talked about filtering your needs and then about filtering your inventions once you've started to come up with inventions, which is in your needs criteria. So I'm gonna take a quick pause here to see if, uh, if anybody has any questions, if anyone um, wants to clarify anything or um, bounce anything off of me um, before we keep going. And uh, since I can't see any faces and we're not in a room, I'm just gonna pause here for about 30 seconds or so. And if you have any questions, just pop it in the chat window and uh, otherwise we'll keep going. All right, I'm not seeing anything. Deepak, feel free to uh, interrupt me if anything, if anything pops up as I'm going here. So for this final part, um, we're gonna step into the brainstorming process. And even though we can't see each other and uh, we don't all have our microphones on, I want to make this a little bit interactive. So we're going to take uh, two to three minutes right now to do a little bit of a, uh, we could either call it an icebreaker, or we could call it a little bit of a creative warm up. Um, but I'm going to do a little something with you guys to sort of get everyone's uh, creative juices going. So grab a pen or paper or something to write with. And once you have it, uh, I want everybody to draw their face without looking. So you can use your other hand to touch your face or touch your eyes and feel things, but keep your eyes closed. And then once that's done, I want you to snap a quick photograph and email it to Deepak. Uh, I have his email on the screen here. And I'm going to give us exactly two minutes on the clock. So once that two minutes runs out, you're gonna email it to Deepak and uh, those are gonna come up later in this talk for us to all uh, see what we've all done as one big group. All right, so I'm starting the two minute timer right now.
Ooh, we actually got some questions. Do you want to hear them now or in a bit? Sure. Um, I don't see anything, so I'm glad. I'm glad you're seeing them. Yeah. Do you? Uh, am I on the full cam? Or can everyone hear me? Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. And everyone can hear. It. And looks like our timer finished. So while we're talking about the questions, everyone uh, just email those pictures to Deepak. Um, yeah. Sure. Go ahead. Why don't you? Why don't you share that question with me? All right. So first one is. Should cost be an absolute prevention me measure, or should we rely on the fact that mass production can ultimately lower costs to desired levels? Or so the so it's a, a two part question. What I'm kind of hearing in the the question is uh, uh, average selling price versus uh, the, the the price to produce, um, and. Right now at this stage, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be looking at, for instance, for the central lines, um, you're going to be trying to get just very rough boundaries for um, what is currently on the market because if you invent something that is similar to a central line and it costs 100 times as much as the products that are out there, it might be something that doesn't make it through your filter. Um, it doesn't have to be um, a hard boundary, but it depends how you have crafted your need statement and what you are um, targeting as your customer. Awesome. Great. Thanks, Dr. Hinden. And another question we had, um, would you recommend participating in the biodesign program upon finishing residency or as a gap? I would uh, so I would recommend doing it uh, whenever whenever it fits into your life. Um, you know whether you're doing it at the end of residency or in the middle of residency um, depends on sort of your own pathway and what you're doing. Um, I, I think that the main consideration is uh, how strong of an applicant you can be. Um, so if you've had a ton of industry experience before, you've invented a couple things, you've built some stuff then uh, I'd say, you know, apply right away. If you are in the midst of starting a couple projects during residency and you're kind of nurturing them along, you might have a stronger application later on. Um, but that said, um, if you apply once and it doesn't work out and you don't get in and then they see you apply in the subsequent year, it actually makes you a stronger applicant. And there's a part of the application where um, there's like a little drop down where they ask if you've applied before or not, um, because they like seeing that, that you are really focused and interested in that. So and, any other questions or should I, should I go into the, uh, the final phase with the brainstorm? I think that's all the questions for now, if you want to continue. Sure, sure. Okay. All right. So. So this is this is kind of the fun part. This is the part that uh, we spent um, a huge part of our year in biodesign getting excited for, and uh, this is the part that most of us think of um, top of mind when we think of making inventions. So before we really scratch the surface and ideation, I think uh, a lot of us are kind of walking around with sort of, uh, I'll call it creativity baggage and uh, limiting beliefs and things that we, uh, sort of bring to the table about what we think is involved with, with creativity and ideation. And uh, I want to get rid of them because uh, as soon as we can get rid of these, the, the stronger the stronger we all can be at ideation and brainstorming together. Um, so this is one, uh, uh, I've lost track of the number of times I've heard this throughout my life. Um, I've always been someone um, that I have uh, I've always sort of earmarked myself as a creative type, so I've often heard this from people who um, have felt that they are not creative and would like to be. And uh, the, the truth is that there's no there's no one type of person who's capable of being creative and someone can. It's more a question of practice and allowing yourself to be creative and giving yourself the time and the space. Now, this myth is uh, something that we, we may not even think about, we might do reflexively, where uh, we are filtering our own ideas before we share them. 
And, you know, there's a time and a place to filter what's in your brain before you speak, um, you know, and it's important for most social interactions to have a little bit of a filter. But when we're talking about brainstorming and coming up with ideas and sharing them, once you've come up with an idea, it does not matter how stupid it looks or how crazy it sounds. You are doing the group and you're doing yourself an injustice by, by not sharing it with someone. And you know, part of why it's so important to do this and to not filter out your ideas is because even if you have something crazy and you, you sort of put it out there, that might unlock something that was sort of nagging in the back of someone else's head. So you might throw an idea up and say, all right, you know, my idea is to have little spaceships come in and do something, you know, hearing something totally out there like that can sort of jog someone else's memory to unlock an idea that they had to sort of build on yours. Um, there are uh, people who hear brainstorming and they think of something very specific. Um, there are lots of ways to brainstorm. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about them today, um, but there is no one way to do it. And I encourage all of you that are on this call right now to try a couple ways out because you're going to be brainstorming more than one round as you start to work on this curriculum. And frankly, if you're on this call right now, my guess is you're probably going to be doing this for the rest of your life, trying to spot ideas and invent stuff. Um, so just sample what's out there, sort of taste the different, the different ways to do it and see what clicks for you. And it may be that switching it up sometimes helps or you've a, a go-to way that works. So finally, before we really uh, talk about some brainstorming ways to get started, um, I want to put some uh, some etiquette out there for all of us to keep in mind. Um, so cell phones, uh, I know you guys are on the call are med students, residents, attendings. Um, we have times where we cannot avoid having our phones on um, because of clinical reasons. Um, but for the most part, it's it's really, really, really helpful and really important to turn the phone off while we're brainstorming. So even if it means you check in between brainstorms, if you turn it off for the five minutes in between and you turn it off for the 10 minutes when everyone is sharing it, you will be so much more plugged in that it will unlock more creativity, not just for you, but for the whole group because it helps everyone feel more immersed. Um, I have the second bullet point that says building on. Um, you know, sometimes when we're excited about something that we've come up with during brainstorming sessions, there can be a tendency to sort of uh, feel like you're biding your time when your teammates are sharing their ideas because you are so excited about this one great idea that you had. You can't wait to get it out there and you can't wait to share it. And it's really important to remember that as other people are putting ideas up there, we're still brainstorming. So if, uh, if Deepak puts an idea on the board that is similar to mine or different from mine but gives me an idea, that's a moment for me to say, you know, building on that, we could do this and this also, and that might give someone else an idea. So when we are sharing our individual ideas sort of towards the end of a brainstorming session, it's still a ripe opportunity to build on other people's ideas. And then finally, uh, that leads into this sort of yes and uh, philosophy. Um, so once we have all of our brainstorms and all of our concepts out there on the table, then we can vote on them and then we can start to choose you know what we're interested in exploring and what might not you know pass through our filters but while we're sharing our ideas up front we never want to be critical of ideas as we're putting them out there and putting them on the table and so that's a moment where we say yes and and we never sort of say no up front so finally we're going to walk through some of the nuts and bolts of brainstorming um, and some of the uh the tools and the the methods that we use. So pre-pandemic, the left-hand side of the screen um, was how I typically um, you know, would run brainstorm sessions. Um, so there's typically a moderator who stands up at the whiteboard and that should rotate. It should really uh, be a different person every time. So, so you don't have one person that's always playing that organizer role. Uh, but there's a moderator that sort of stands at the front of the room and, and uh, handles the stopwatch and then everybody including the moderator uh, typically grabs a pack of post-its and scribbles their ideas on it um, until, until the, time, the time runs out and then typically as we share we go around the room and everyone puts their post-its on the board and you can start clustering post-its by similar ideas and, and things like that that we can talk about. Now when we transition to the virtual environment with the pandemic 
um, I started looking for similar tools that would let us accomplish that. Um, there's one called Mural, M-U-R-A-L, that I have here. Um, I think I think you can get a one month or maybe even a three month trial that's pretty robust. Um, there's another there's another called Miro, M-I-R-O, and all of these are essentially digital analogs of a whiteboard and post-it. So it lets all of the teams share the same screen and um, you can see in their little promotional material here, different team names, team, uh, team member names and different color post-its. And so in real time, you can see someone else's post-it as they're putting it up on the screen. Um, so those are just two tools that I found effective. Um, there are others out there, but um, it's useful to sort of think of upfront before you need to use the tools for your brainstorming. And so I kind of alluded to this already, but uh, the key here is to not brainstorm for fantastic ideas and you know just the best cream of the crop ideas. The key at the front is to go for quantity, is to sort of come up with as many ideas as you can and start weeding it out. And uh, one thing that I don't have in the slides that's important um, for all of us to recognize, when we brainstorm ideas, uh, it's just human nature. All of us typically think of the same types of ideas at first. So there's this kind of first round where everyone you know, comes up with the most obvious ideas. So to use a central line example, in that first round of brainstorming, people are going to think of different coatings for central lines. People are going to think of different dressings for central lines, all sorts of different iterations of ways to prevent central line infections. So it's important to do that brainstorm to sort of get those ideas out. But then you, you need to go back and do another and then another. And once you start forcing yourself to go deeper into crazier and newer and different ideas, that's when you guys are going to really start to get to the gold. So it's, uh, it's important not only to, to go for quantity, but to force yourself once you've brainstormed and everyone's come up with all the ideas that they can to do it again and force yourself to come up with even more and even more. And that's when you'll really start to unlock new insights. We've talked about this. Uh, so item one on this list is when you have your group you're gonna brainstorm with, um, we should take turns and have a different point person for each brainstorming session. Um, each session uh, you wanna have everyone sort of uh, agree to a certain time. And I like to make it short because it's better to sort of wrap up your brainstorming session with the, the timer runs out and you need another two or three seconds to jot down a couple things than to give yourself 20 minutes and just have the energy really lag because you ran out of ideas and you can't think anymore. So start off by keeping it short and then you can always have uh, new sessions. One of the techniques that uh, I find really helpful for brainstorming um, and uh, most design firms that do this for, uh, for a living um, typically employees is making how might we statements. So the first round of brainstorming um, is not going to be, you know, uh, central line example again, it's not going to be round one, we're going to brainstorm all the different devices that can prevent central line infections. We're going to brainstorm the how might we topics. So you might come up with how might we coat lines so that bacteria uh, can't stick to them. How might we prevent contamination as a line's being placed? How might we? And so you're going to brainstorm all these different how might we's, which are sort of themes and topics and ideas. And then after you've done that, you'll share with each other and you'll pick a couple how might we's, and then you take that how might we, and then you brainstorm that. So let's say the winner is uh, how might we coat central lines um, to make them slippery to bacteria, and uh, how might we render uh, lines impenetrable to bacteria, let's say those are the two winners, then you'll sit down and you'll brainstorm around answering that how might we. So that's what I have here. Um, so once you've sort of shared all of your brainstormed how might we's, then you uh, pick a couple and you brainstorm some concepts. Um, now something that's effective for doing this is to look at categories sometimes. Um, and so this is an example of uh, uh, an exercise that I walked through with some teammates where we were uh, practicing the process with um, CSF contamination and people who, who have 
different types of um, CSF monitors. So whether we're talking about a bolt or something else, we were asking how might we prevent bacteria from contaminating CSF? And uh, I'm not sure, depending what size screen uh, each of you are using, I'm not sure if you can see, but they start to sort into specific categories. So uh, classically, you will have a biological, an electrical, a chemical, and a mechanical category. And as you start coming up with ideas, you'll see where they sort. And one helpful way of organizing all the ideas that your teammates have come up with is putting it onto a mind map. Because then you can tell at a quick glance, hey, you know, we really haven't come up with many ideas for chemical methods. And that might then sort of stir you to dive deeper into that, that one area. Um, there are different types of software for mind maps. There's something called MindMeister. Um, I think this one I made with something called MindNode, uh, I think, for the Mac. Uh, but if you just Google mind map software, uh, you'll find that there are a ton of free and uh, low cost softwares. And so finally, we are going to put our needs criteria to use. So once you have um, come up with some ideas and some concepts to make inventions, this is when you critically have to hold it up next to your needs criteria and say, gee, uh, does this really meet this must have? And if it doesn't, you strike it from the list. And that's why your needs criteria are so important because when you set those criteria, you're committing to throwing out any concept you come up with that doesn't meet all those parameters. And uh, part of the biodesign process and really being rigorous about it is putting in the time and effort and thought to lock down your must-haves. Because if you come up with a concept that you love and you compare it to a must-have and you say, well, you know, it doesn't quite do this, but you know, maybe that wasn't so important, then you're breaking the whole process and you're getting into dangerous territory because then you are falling in love with your invention and you're letting that dictate where you go. So you have to get used to, we call it throwing out your babies and there are all sorts of different crude ways of looking at it, but you have to force yourself to stay true to the process. And uh, so finally, um, this is a, uh, a project that I like to go through with, uh, with folks when we're doing these workshops in person. Um, but I think this is uh, in general, a helpful, a helpful exercise to look at. Um, so if, if uh, I'm in the Bay Area right now, but um, this is always, always a great concept um, to do brainstorming around because everyone sort of understands forest fires. So if we wanted to do a brainstorming, uh, a brainstorming session around forest fires, we'd start with how might we's, and uh, we might ask questions about, gee, how might we detect forest fires before they get out of hand? How might we prevent them? How might we extinguish them earlier? And you'll start with a round of brainstorming the how might we's. And then once you have your favorite how might we's, then you start brainstorming concepts. So I would encourage you guys with your teammates as you start to get ready to embark on this process, do a couple practice sessions with things like, uh, like these topics where everyone sort of intuitively has a working knowledge of at least some of the basics. And then once you are doing this for your disease process, whether it's COVID or anything in the future, before you start this time point, before you start the brainstorming, you want to take a deep dive in the subject matter to really, really build your expertise. So that's all that I have for prepared material. Um, I put my uh, social stuff up on the screen so you guys can connect with me. Um, always happy to talk through the process, to, uh, to join a brainstorm, to collaborate, get creative, um, or anything at all. Um, and uh, I guess, Deepak, I'll, uh, I'll hand the mic back over to you to see if there are any questions that folks have and um, any thoughts that people have. And while we're doing that, I'm going to put up on the screen what everybody created. So let me see if I can turn this off real quick. Uh, can, can you still see my screen or is it off right now? Um, it's still off right now. 
Okay, perfect, perfect. Give me one second. I'm gonna show you guys what creative artists everyone is. And uh, I can't see any questions um, from my viewing context, but uh, Deepak can. So uh, feel free to toss anything in his window and then he can pass it to me. Yeah, if you guys have any questions, feel free to shoot it in the chat box. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Hendon. I can speak for all of us when I say we learned a lot. Oh, great. It was, it was my pleasure. Let's see. Um, am I, I'm not sharing screen yet, am I? Now you are. Can you see the screen with the art on it? Yep. You guys are incredible artists. Especially like some of these digital ones here. Alrighty. Well, I am. Uh, should I assume that that uh, everyone's all set? Yeah. Let me quickly show uh, one of my slides for a moment. I will take sure. control again. Yeah. And in the meantime, um, someone asked, "Which face drawing is your favorite?" <laughs> 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 Let me see. I like. I like a lot of these. I think my favorite is the one that looks like the one that looks like uh, Picasso that has far right second row. I, I like I like how the circle is cutting through the face there. That's kind of cool. But these are all neat. These are all fun. You gotta show your screen again. Oh yeah, yeah. Here, let me uh, let me uh, <laughs> put my screen back on. I don't think I can show it. Here, let me. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. I mean, these are all good. It's really hard to say. They're all just incredible. <laughs> Which one did you choose? Oh, I, I like this one with the circle <laughs> kind of cut through. I like it. I like all of them. These are. Uh, these are a lot of fun. So you guys, uh, you guys did a great job, and I think they're more fun having all of them together as like one big clump too. Yeah, this is really funny. Um, so we actually have another question. Um, sure. Do you have Do you have any advice on protecting intellectual property? Yeah, I do. Um, so uh, the the first piece of advice that that I have is is uh, counterintuitive. It's um, not to be so narrow-minded that you uh, stunt your growth and stunt your ability to come up with ideas. Um, so for one of the projects that I'm working on for a vascular catheter, um, I had a long, really fruitful conversation with the uh, the CEO of one and the CTO of the other of the, the two companies that are our biggest competition. And we're talking, you know, multi-billion dollar companies um, and they were happy to talk to me because they realized, look, he's never going to be a threat to us because he's not going to enter the market anywhere near the same time we are. And uh, you know, they weren't going to steal our ideas because we were at a very sort of high level concept. So I think when, when we're talking about IP, um, things like NDAs and all that stuff, they make you sound like you are a hotshot or they feel like they make you sound like a hotshot. But the reality is, uh, no VC will ever sign an NDA. Uh, if you ask them to sign an NDA, they're they're happy just to take an appointment with someone else, you know, waiting behind you. Um, and in the beginning, you're really just uh, trying to, you know, maybe not spill the beans and tell everyone everything about your idea, but sort of stay kind of high level when you're talking about your thoughts and you know asking people questions. Um, the one caveat to to sort of protecting yourself with IP is uh, brainstorming. Um, because once you brainstorm with people, um, you make you you effectively are making them co-inventors. Um, so it's uh, 
it's not bad to do that. And sometimes it's, it's, you know, a great intentional choice to bring someone in who's a clinical expert in that domain or, um, you know, who's creative that, you know, and, um, but uh, just realize that once they, once they join your brainstorm, um, they may be involved with generating some of that initial IP. Um, and then the final piece of advice, uh, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit up in the air on this one. Um, some people will recommend that you uh, sign and date, you know, every single post-it note before you put it on the board. And, you know, uh, that depends more on your teammates and who you're working with. I think, I think, you know, part of me wants to feel that if, if you don't trust them to not screw you over, you probably shouldn't be working with them to begin with. Um, other people feel like it's naive to say that, and it's just good for you to initial, initial your ideas when you put it up. Um, because later, if, if you file for IP, um, you know, uh, anyone who had an idea that was sort of relevant to what you're filing um, that participated in that brainstorm ought to have a claim on it. Great, thanks for sharing. Um, and I think we have time for one more question. Um, so we actually got sure. one really good question about if you have any suggestions for how students can best um, identify pain points on their clinical rotations. Sure. Uh, so one of the um, one of the shortcomings of having to cram all this into an hour is that uh, you guys really got um, shortchanged out of a, a bunch of the process. And one of the areas that we left out is needs what we call needs validation and needs screening. So what you will do in your clinical rotation is make yourself a sponge or a lens or a lens and a sponge. You, you want to sort of notice everything going on around you where someone you know might be struggling a little bit more or where patients are complaining about something and just not giving a great answer. Um, I always like to joke around that you know a smoking gun for an unmet need is gabapentin you know because you know so many people get put on gabapentin and it never really fixes the, the primary problem. Um, but the, the first part of the process is just sort of collecting everything that you can observe and everything you notice around you and writing it down. And then the second half of that is what we call a validation. And that's not uh, a one and done uh, conversation as much as it's a process. So if you see, uh, I'm trying to think of an IR example. Let's say, um, let's say you see that there's a particular type of uh, pigtail that um, just slips out all the time or, you know, it doesn't stay in place or it always has to be upsized or it always clogs, you know, that may be an observation that you make, but then the next step to see if it's really a need is to go out and validate it. So speak to the, speak to the attendings that are placing that device and say, you know, is this a problem that you've noticed? And, you know, if it is a problem, you know, is this happening once or twice a year or once or twice a week? And as you start to get more and more confirmation that you're onto something, then you might start to talk to clinicians who are in the community, clinicians in private practice, clinicians in an academic practice to start to get sort of a broader sample. Um, and then you might um, start d digging into the hospital economic value and seeing, you know, quantifying if you have a couple different problems that all have a similar frequency, which one costs the hospital more money? Because that is something that hospitals are going to be more likely to invest in down the line if you solve. And if everything else is equal and the patient impact is equal and the provider impact is equal, then that's a stakeholder that can be become that can become really important. So we talk about validating it. And when we validate it, we talk to different stakeholders. Great, thank you so much for, you know, sharing all your insights on this. Um, I think we all learned a lot. Sure, that was my pleasure. And feel free to reach out. I'm happy to I'm happy to chat or connect about um, about creativity, about biodesign stuff, about about anything. Um, and it's great great getting to getting to meet you guys virtually. Hey, thank you so much. I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, so for everyone who stuck around, thank you so much for sticking around. Um, so if you can just take a quick moment to fill out the post webinar survey so you can pull it up either using this QR code here or you will will also be sending out an email to all of you um, with a link to the survey as well. Um, so our next webinar um, will be um, the clinical needs and IR webinar on the 12th of next month. 
um, where we're going to be talking about various IR needs um, that Dr. Navaluri has encountered in his practice, and also introduce some of the COVID-related prompts related to our competition for this year. Um, so yeah, thank you again to Dr. Hinden for giving us this really amazing talk, and we hope to see everyone again next time. All right, thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night.